Thank you, Dr. Williams. Yep. Uh, okay, good, good morning, guys. Again, my name is uh, Ross Kramer. Probably 25, 30 years ago, I was sitting where you guys uh, were sitting. Uh, really tough to imagine that I'm uh, standing up here. I am probably uh, a good example of a runaway American dream. Uh, so I want to take you through a little bit of sort of where uh, I've come from, sort of what, I, what I'm seeing sort of the future of business looking like right now and try to give you guys some, um, give you guys some direction in terms of where I think, you know, some encouragement of, of where to go. So um, my, the business that I run is called ListTrack. Uh, ListTrack was not necessarily the business. It is, it is the current version of what I started in my dorm room, which was a web hosting business. Um, part of the the theme of today's uh, talk is really about change um, and, and um, how you've got to be open to change, flexible to change, and being able to, um, to em embrace change. Um, but ListTrack is the, is the name of the, of the company. We're based in Lidditz. Um, Corinne is one of our uh, interns turned part-timer uh, right now, hopefully turned full-timer uh, upon graduation. Um, and uh, so um, we are a, we're a, a digital marketing platform. That's what we do today. So we're a digital marketing platform, um, really across channels, email marketing, SMS, display advertising, social, paid social um, advertising, um, so push notifications, uh, mobile push, desktop push. Um, that is really what we do. Um, our, uh, our target market are retailers. Um, so, so the retailers um, that are either pure play online or they've got stores and they're online or maybe they've got a catalog. Um, some, of the, some of the logos uh, are, are behind us um, right here. So these are some of our, uh, some, some of our customers. Again, theme of today's talk is about change. One of the things that we say at ListTrack is the only thing constant at ListTrack is change. So that's kind of today's theme is, um, is change. This is a picture uh, that the Lebanon Daily News, this is a picture, the Lebanon Daily News wrote an article about me. I sort of, I may have lied a little bit. I didn't really start the business in my dorm room. I actually started when I was in high school. Um, I started selling computers uh, out of my parents' back room when I was in, in high school. Sounds a little bit better with the college dorm room uh, story. But so, so London Daily News heard about this. They came, they, they took a picture um, of me. So this is a picture of me when I was in my parents' back room with my, my business selling computers. Uh, when I got out of college, um, my father and I, my father wanted to start a business. He was in banking. Um, and uh, so we both started a business on the same day. This is, was our very first uh, office um, building. This was the, 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 it was like the back of a guy's house on Main Street in Lidditz on a cold winter day. Like this one, you'd have to put your coat on uh, to go to the bathroom because the place had no bathroom. Uh, the uh, landlord was too cheap to cut a hole in the wall to access his, his toilet, so we had to put our coat on, which is kind of uh, humbling, but it's sort of startup uh, lure. Uh, Corinne can tell you we now have a number of bathrooms. Uh, no coat on to go to the bathroom, right, Corinne? So if anybody thinking about coming to intern with us, you can leave your coat at home. Um, from a people perspective, um, you know, we, we're a technology business. I'm sort of a technology guy, but I'm not a coder. Um, if you want to be uh, in technology and you're not good at coding, the first thing that I would recommend you do is, is go befriend a coder. Uh, head over to the computer science building, uh, hang out at the computer lab, and, and befriend somebody that's good at, good at coding. Uh, that was, that's probably one of, my, one of my greater talents in this world, is uh, befriending uh, guys that can write uh, good code. Some of those guys are on the screen here. Uh, Mike Hartman uh, was my college roommate. Uh, Brent Schroyer, I, I did stuff in high school with Brent. And Brian Slode uh, was, uh, was a partner uh, of mine in an IT class and sort of an MIS class that we had together. So one of the very first things that I did when I was in college was I, I surrounded myself with, with smart people. Um, and I've heard, you've maybe heard the maximum that um, you are the average of your five uh, best friends um, and the five people that you sort of hang out with. You're sort of the average of those guys. So. Um, if you want to sort of level yourself up, I encourage you guys to, you know, maybe find friends that are kind of a, a, level, a, a level up. 
Um, it's probably my first uh, uh, first tip. Th these guys super smart. They're you know cumulative uh, math uh, parts um, is you know probably 2,300 on their you know math SAT for these guys. So so really smart guys. Uh, so Dad and I go in business. We got a trade show uh, booth. This was our very first trade show booth. Um, a little 10 by 10 type of thing. We laugh at this thing now because the current trade show booth hardly fits in this room. It's certainly taller than the, than the ceiling is here. But this is our first, first trade show booth. Uh, anybody know who these guys are? Anybody know? Anybody know these guys? So Microsoft, you know Microsoft? So this, is, uh, this was Microsoft's uh, very first uh, company picture, uh, 1978. We had a similar one. Uh, fr from ours, we had employed my, my uh, dear cousin Marshall at the time and a couple other guys in the picture. This was us in, in, in 2001. 2009, we moved into a new, uh, a new building, larger building. This is us in, in 2009. And then our current building is about 100,000 square foot, uh, 100,000 square foot building uh, in Lidditz that we just recently built. And that's the one that we've got about, um, about 270 people working in that building. Uh, we've got a couple of people that work uh, from home across the country, and then we have another office um, out in Newport Beach, California. So as I, I was putting this deck together um, and I was flipping through, I thought, you know, there's a lot of things that are changing, and the, there's a, the opportunity that you guys have is really to look at the way that the world is changing and harness a number of those changes. And what I want to try to do is sort of point out some of the ways that the world is, is, is changing and how you can grasp onto that. For me, it was pretty easy. When I was sitting in your seats in 1995, the internet was just getting its legs. So, um, you know, we did not have the internet on mobile phones, but we did have them on our laptops and it was available in the, in the computer labs. Um, and it was so easy to know, hey, I'm just going to grab onto that thing. And that's really all I did was I sort of, I, I, I just sort of grabbed onto the internet. It became this really big thing. And, and that, those winds of change have, have powered me for the past 20 years. So as you guys sit in your seats, you know, I think about what winds of change can you grab onto. I've got a couple of those ideas. But let's go and look at that very first picture that I showed you guys and sort of what's changed in that picture. So if you look at the picture, uh, at the time, back then, Dr. Williams, you probably remember this, when we put a screen in front of the screen, that was a thing that we did. I don't know why you know, we did it then or why we don't do it now, but we don't do that anymore. That's the thing that we don't do anymore. Uh, what else don't we do anymore just in this picture? Uh, do any of you guys connected to the internet via a modem? The B -D -D? No, we don't do that anymore. That's what I used to do in my dorm room. Uh, we don't do that anymore. So we just, you know, we've, we've got the internet on our phones. It's through the air. We didn't have Wi-Fi then. So, so that changed. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, dot matrix printer. Any of your printers go like you, you got those printers here? No. We've got laser printers now. So, you know, printing has changed. Um, something else on here. Anybody rocking out with the Sony 7-disc uh, CD changer in the dorm room? Nobody's got those things. <laughs> Uh, no, so the, you know, the way that we can consume music um, has changed. So technology changed. As things change, it creates opportunity for you guys. But you've got to, you've got to see that opportunity and grasp onto that, onto that opportunity. In the middle is really where um, financial gain, personal gain, professional gain happens. But you've got to be able to, to spot that. Um, how about fashion? So fashion changes um, as well. Um, let's look at sort of what I was rocking in that picture. Uh, turtleneck. Any of you guys rocking a turtleneck today? Anybody? No? Nope. How about the baggy uh, gap sweater? You know, no, we don't do that. We got like, uh, we got uh, form fitty, fitting body con stuff from, you know, H&M uh, these days, right? Not to mention, let's, let's speak about how fashion's priced. Um, so this sweater probably cost my a uh, high school girlfriend who bought it for me for Christmas that year, probably set her back 65 bucks. Who spent $65 on a sweater these days? Like nobody. These days with 65 bucks, you can go into H&M, buy like nine outfits, right? Corinne, am I close? You know? Uh, now you've got to throw it away uh, later that night because it's, you know, turned to shreds because um, it's, you know, it's not made with a high quality. But this concept of the concept, so the fashion itself, 
how the fashion is made and how it's priced and distributed, you know, we don't even really go, some of us go to the mall, but many of us just sort of get out our phones and buy it. Um, so the way that we wear clothes, the way that we buy clothes has changed as well. Um, how about healthcare and how healthcare changes? I'll come back to healthcare in a little bit, but I had glasses in there. Now you go to a doctor, you strap your head into this thing, they shoot two lasers into your eye, and like uh, an hour later, you don't have to wear glasses anymore, which is amazing. But I highly recommend it for any of you guys rocking the specs uh, today is to go get LASIK and then you don't have to deal with smudgy glasses uh, anymore. So uh, how about what's not, what's not changed? Um, so while some things change, there are other things that don't change. And maybe some of you guys are like, I am, do not like change. I like things just the way they are and the way they were. So for you guys, there are some things in this picture that has not changed. So, uh, furniture has not changed, like that crappy furniture that doesn't survive two moves. Anybody move one of these guys once and you know by the next time you move the desk it's going to just be crap? Anybody got that desk? Okay, so, so this one's available. This was on staples.com website. You can go buy it. It's very similar to the same one that my parents bought 30 years ago. So furniture has not changed. Well, some things do change furniture. Uh, furniture has, uh, has changed. So. Uh, one of the things in reading the, kind of the, the prospectus around coming to talk to you guys is, hey, Russ, talk about what's made you uh, successful. So, so what's, what, what's some of the, the secret to success? So let's, let's talk a, a little bit about that. Um, Gretzky uh, had this uh, really famous uh, hockey player named Wayne, Wayne Gretzky. He had a great quote, um, which was, I skate to where I believe the puck is going, not where it's been. And that's really my encouragement for you guys is to think about in business, in life, in culture, as you know, you spend the next few years here on campus, where is the, where's the puck going in business? Um, what companies are growing? What things um, are, are different companies um, latching onto? Where, where are the opportunities going to be uh, for me? So we're going to set up, set up a couple of those types of things. But this is, this is one that really resonates with me as I lead my company and I try to keep my technology company really at the forefront and, uh, and on that trajectory of where the puck is going. It's an important thing for me to think about as a CEO of a technology company. So three things that we did um, really well um, from a business perspective over the last um, couple years. So the first one is uh, to pick an industry. Um, so I'm going to present kind of a, a financial slide over the last 10 years or so at list track of kind of where some of our financial um, successes come from, but it, it really is around kind of sort of these three concepts. So when I was um, in the college dorm room and one of the things we were doing was we were, one of the things we got started with was we got started making websites, okay? And I thought perhaps that there was strength in making websites for lots of different companies. I thought, boy, if we really spread the risk out across a lot of different companies, um, that, would, that would help us. Um, however, it tended to have kind of an opposite effect because we weren't really able to get to number two, which is to solve business problems. So solving business problems is really, really critical. It is perhaps the most critical thing that any company can do is to solve a business problem. Um, and uh, I got some really good advice, which was kind of, you know, embrace these three things, which was pick an industry, solve business problems, and define what I'll go into uh, as, an, as an ICP. So, um, for us, what we did was when we went from serving lots of different customers to just serving retailers, we were able to focus on what are the problems that retailers have. And we were able to interview some of those uh, companies and really discover what are some of the problems that, that you had. And one of the problems that, that some online retailers said was, hey, we've gone online. What we found is a lot of people are adding items to the shopping cart and then abandoning. And then, and we have no visibility into who they are, what they're interested in, who might most be interested in coming back. 
who might be the ones that we could perhaps influence with an incentive or some other types of marketing um, to have them come back, and who are just window shopping and browsing and have no interest in coming back and we shouldn't spend any money on those guys. So that was a, a, a business problem that they presented to me. We said, hmm, we could probably solve that with some of our cross-channel marketing things that we do. Another big thing and another sort of wind of change that's happening is data. This is a big, uh, my big encouragement for you all is to think about data. Um, we are swimming today in data. Um, executives, other CEOs like me are swimming in data. We have more data than we know what to do with. What we're really poor on and what we really don't have enough of is insights is to be able to translate that data into what does that data mean? Um, and what does that data mean for me to be able to make decisions that help, to help me make decisions that help me run my company better, that help me um, take care of my customers better, that help me understand where I should put a plant or a store or a distribution center or something like that. So your ability to um, analyze data, to be able to process that data and distill it down back into insights that help executives make better decisions, that's, that's really an opportunity that you've, that you've got. So um, we picked, uh, we sort of uh, picked an industry, we picked a few problems for us to solve, and then we defined our ICP. Now I know a lot of you guys are thinking, yeah, perfect, ICP, insane clown posse. Thank you, you're supposed to laugh a little bit, a little bit more than that. You guys still rock out to the ICP here on campus? No? Nope. Yes, no? Come on, Dr. Williams, anybody bring up Insane no. Clown Posse yet? No, okay, all right. I'm trying to warm you guys up. There are some like starch shirt executive guys that get a bigger, bigger uh, rise out of There's ICP. No grateful dead, love is it? All right, fair enough, fair enough. So what am I mean by uh, ICP? I mean your ideal client profile. So for us, focusing on who our ideal client profile was. And it's really important for any business to understand who is our ideal customer? And sometimes that really means taking a hard look at who, is, who, is, who are we today, who were we yesterday, who will we be tomorrow, and who is that core customer that, 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 we, can, uh, that, that we can really uh, serve. So um, that's when we, de we developed, and sometimes your ideal, uh, ideal client profile will sort of move over time. Ours has surely moved over time from smaller retailers to, um, uh, to larger retailers. Now what you see behind me is a chart of our financial performance over the last 10 years or so. Um, and it's uh, charted over top line revenue. And you can see throughout kind of the mid uh, uh, 2000s, we, we were fairly flat. You know, we were a company that was um, kind of sort of a lifestyle uh, business, family-run business, Lancaster County business. Um, one day when we moved into uh, uh, to our uh, sort of the last headquarters that we had in 2009, we said, let's commit to getting the, to the next level. We made some, um, some critical um, hires uh, to get us to the next level. But the other thing that we really did was we were able to focus. And we were able to ins go from doing lots of different things to lots of different businesses to doing a few very specific things to a much smaller pool of, of customers, which were really retailers that were making between, say, 10 million and 50 million online. We saw that there was an opportunity there, and we really focused on that ideal customer profile. That focus allowed us to really focus on solving their business problems. That focus on business problems led to customer intimacy, and that customer intimacy led to them paying us more because we were very intimate with them and we were intimate in solving their problems, led us to growing the, the business. So it's a little bit about, uh, little bit about that. Um, I said I was gonna come back to, to healthcare, um, and uh, <clears throat> sometimes the words change and disruption um, can be synonymous. Um, th the opportunities for you guys um, is to really disrupt some uh, kind of current business paradigm. So we're gonna talk about how I, in particular, consume healthcare, because I think it's an interesting story to, uh, to, to bring to you guys. So we'll talk, talk a little bit about healthcare disruption, but we'll start with Netflix. 
You guys like Netflix, right? Everybody likes, everybody loves Netflix, right? So we all love Netflix. How many of you guys love going to the doctor? Not so much, right? So um, when you think about the experience of consuming Netflix, right, it's really easy. You can consume it at home. You can consume it um, on the road. You can consume it in the dorm room or uh, at your friend's house. So that's where you can consume Netflix. When you think about going to the doctor, what do we have to do? We have to call them up. We have to make an appointment. We have to drive over there or get a lift or take an Uber. We talk about Uber and the disruption that Uber had and sort of, <laughs> of transportation. But we have to get there. Then we sit in a room with a bunch of other people coughing. And then the doctor comes. And because he's paid on volume, he is incented to see you as quickly as possible, try to diagnose what might be wrong with you um, as quickly as possible, and then get you the heck out the doors as quick as possible. Um, that model, I believe, is ripe for disruption. And I think there's a number of things in healthcare that's sort of um, ripe for disruption, none of which I have any time at all in my day to focus on, but maybe you guys do. So here's the idea that I give to you guys. So this is actually my doctor. So this is a, a doctor, Dr. Chris Hager. And uh, the guys down at Lancaster General Health uh, had a concept of what if we could do sort of a Netflix model for primary care medicine. So when I need to talk to my doctor, um, so like when I was out in Salt Lake City last week and I ran out of, my, uh, out of a prescription that I use, I used a mobile app that Chris and I use to communicate with each other. So I use a, I've got a mobile app on my phone, it's called Twine. When I step on my Wi-Fi enabled scale in the morning, that goes back to Dr. Chris. Dr. Chris then uses push notifications and a messaging app here called Twine to be able to say like, you know, hey, uh, fatty, lay off the cheesesteaks uh, type of stuff. Um, I also have a Wi-Fi enabled blood pressure cuff that he's able to um, keep track of my blood pressure and my vitals and, and that, type of, that type of thing. Um, the model here for Chris is that he's only going to take so many patients. So I'll pay a little bit more um, for my service than I normally would for primary care, but my intimacy with Chris, um, the patient care that he's able to deliver, and the fact that I can communicate with him really any time that he's awake is sort of an off the charts experience. So as you guys go throughout your day, I really, and, and your, your lives, I really encourage you to think about what, what is it that you interact with in this world that has really crappy user experiences, like going to the doctor. And can you use these extremely powerful pocket computers that we're all walking around with? So, one of the cool things is I can do video back and forth with Chris using the pocket computer. It's got a GPS baked in. He knows where in the world I might be and what pharmacy I'm closest to with, my, with the mobile device to be able to intelligently route um, a, uh, a prescription to the nearest pharmacy. So these mobile devices that we have give you guys so much more opportunity than I had when I was lugging around a giant laptop type of thing. So there's great opportunities and there's disruption and business opportunities around every corner. You've just got to sort of know where to look for them. Um, I think uh, Jeff Bezos had a really great, really great quote. He was talking about customers and, and he said one of the things that's great about customers is a lot of times they're upset. Um, and if you understand why they're angry, why they're upset, why they're discontented, there's usually a solution in there that they'll pay for. And you think about things like Uber, you think about these, this app like Twine that's allowing me and my doctor to communicate. There's a lot of opportunities out there. The other big opportunity um, that I wanted to also say, and, and hopefully these winds are blowing throughout the campus, is the opportunity around um, artificial intelligence. Um, that is the rage. In our space, um, many, many, many of the buyers want um, 
they want some type of artificial intelligence attached to whatever they're buying. So this is a picture of Alan Turing. This goes back to the, uh, these, this concept of artificial intelligence, goes back all the way to the, um, the back into the sort of military era of the, of the world wars when, when Alan was trying to break the, the Enigma codes um, using kind of electro-mechanical machines. Um, the world has kind of, um, kind of progressed, um, but it's got, the, the concept of artificial intelligence has some roots all the way back to the early industrial era. And if you think about in the early industrial era, almost um, pre-industrial era, almost all machines were either hooked up to some type of human-powered device. You think about you know, making um, garments. You had people spinning um, looms with hand, by hand. After that, you had, um, you had animal-powered devices. But when the Industrial Revolution came around, there was this thing called electricity. And electricity allowed us to, to create the electric motor. And all of those human-powered machines or animal-powered machines got connected eventually to an electric motor. And that really powered the Industrial Revolution. Into the future, artificial intelligence has the same type of implications because the tasks aren't going to change. So like the task here of driving is not going to change. But if we could free up ourselves from the labor of the task, that's the thing that's really going to change. And that's the opportunity that you guys have to disrupt or to add value into the future as, as you think about how you want to play um, a role in the future of business is, can we use things like predictive analytics, machine learning, um, and, art, and kind of in this overall em embracing concept of artificial intelligence to free us up from the labor of the task to go on and do more meaningful things and more creative things. And, um, you know, so for example, um, Corinne is writing articles for us. So she's doing content creation for us. Could one of you guys create some type of machine learning algorithm that crawled across the internet that understood what pieces of content are our target marketers most likely to read and to give that back to Corinne so she would be freed up from doing the research of those articles and be able to maybe be more creative in how she writes the articles. So just like electricity connected to a water pump, if you could connect machine learning or, out or, or artificial intelligence to the research, the analysis, or even the wordsmithing, the words um, that Corinne uses to write. So we've got, we've got things like, uh, uh, we've got grammar checkers inside of our word processors. We've got spell checkers inside of, our word process inside of our word processors these days. What we really need is the ways for us um, to perhaps make our writing more creative or better connect to our audience. These are some, some of the ideas that I'm, um, that I'm thinking about. Um, the type of artificial intelligence that we need is not the type of artificial intelligence that we have now. The type of AI that we have now is defined as narrow AI. The type of AI that, that you guys will help to, to build and design and, and the future of that is really broad artificial intelligence. That's more sort of Terminator things. Broad-based uh, broad artificial intelligence is um, where multiple types of cognition will be able to come together to build a machine that really understands its environment and is be able to, to make decisions around the, the environment. Um, the type of AI that we have today is called narrow. That type of AI does things like intelligently routes me here uh, to the Hoover building on time um, and around uh, traffic jams. So this is a type of uh, narrow based AI um, or uh, natural language speech processing. That's a type of narrow based um, AI that we've got today um, or computer vision. Um, computer vision is a type of AI. This is uh, howold.net. Anybody use howold.net? Any of you guys? Nobody? Okay, so I don't know if I'm early with this or if I'm late with this. I'm not quite sure if I'm, if I, if I'm cool or not cool. But it's an interesting thing where you, take, you go to howold.net with your mobile phone, you take a picture, and then it, it uses uh, machine learning 
uh, based on a lot of pictures of people that, that it knows their age, it then predicts what the ages of the people in the picture are. Uh, it's a favorite of my, my family. This is a picture of, of uh, Carson, Kira, and my wife. It's tough to see, but it, it claims that my wife is 27 years old. Uh, hint, she was not 21 when we had uh, Kira. Um, so, but while um, machine learning and AI has gotten a lot better, we still have some, some, some challenges, like being able to spot the differences between a labradoodle and a piece of fried chicken. These are the things that you guys will solve um, in the future. Uh, the difference between a barn owl uh, or a slice uh, of apple um, or even a chihuahua or a blueberry muffin. You guys see this one on Twitter? Anybody see this one on Twitter? Okay, you need to spend more time on your phones on Twitter, clearly, guys. Uh, so anyway, uh, com computers can now see. Um, and and the, the, the real fact of the matter is computers today can tell the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. Um, the, the opportunity that you guys do have um, is to be able to take these sort of disparate areas of artificial intelligence and bring them together in a more broad way to really help unlock labor tasks. Um, some of the best inventions in the industrial age took, some of, took the most amount of human labor and took the human labor out, uh, out of that. And you know, if you look at where we are today from a jobless perspective, do we have a high unemployment or low unemployment? We've got low unemployment right now, right? So you know, clearly we're not out of work because of the machines. We've just been able to go on to do more meaningful things um, in our lives. So computers shouldn't necessarily, this kind of concept of artificial intelligence, shouldn't threaten us in the, in the same way that you know, the steam shovel threatened a laborer uh, back in the day. We've all gone on to make sort of uh, higher incomes and, and stay uh, employed. Um, so I got a slide here which is really just saying that um, most executives today know that there's a revolution in artificial intelligence that's coming. Few of them really know what the impact is going to be on them, and they don't know how to implement it. That's really where you guys come in. Great opportunity in AI uh, for you guys. Uh, big, big thing within sort of where uh, I see the winds of, of, of change going. It's just in New York this week at a, a CEO conference of CEOs of, of all of the major fashion retailers and fashion brands. Um, I was hanging out with uh, guys like Tommy Hilfiger and Chris Jenner all week, and what was really interesting was they were all, you know, even the, the Kardashian guys were talking about data, and that they need to be data-led. So there's this concept, and it's kind of an old concept of data-driven. You hear this: we need to be data-driven, data-driven. Uh, I think it is more important to be data-led. So the difference there, and the subtle difference is, uh, for me to be data-driven would be to say, uh, hey, Corinne, I've got this idea of where I want to take the business. Can you go out and find you know, some articles online or find some, you know, do a Google image search of some graphs and charts um, that, are, that are sort of based on data that will support this thought? Okay, that's kind of the old school way of being data driven. And we find things, it's presented in a way that drives our company forward. And we're like, yeah, we, we use data to make that decision. Um, data led is where you go into a decision more in a naive way. And by using higher level statistical analysis, things like machine learning or things like predictive analytics that really allow the data to show us where we're going uh, into the future and allowing that to, to lead us. So being data-led, much greater than being data-driven. Um, I've got a good saying. I like to say, in God we trust, all others bring data. It's one that I wanted to bring for you guys today. Uh, my other one is, without data, you're just another guy with an opinion. So, um, so important to be able to back up um, what your thoughts are um, in business with actual data uh, today. So uh, that's some of the kind of areas where I think stuff's going. We'll talk a little bit about, in the final couple minutes that I've got with you guys, around 
some of the things that have kind of made the business um, successful and, and running a business. And if you guys are, any of you are thinking about um, running your own businesses, highly recommend that. You won't make any money for the first few years, um, but uh, you'll be really poor. I was really poor. You grind it out for a while, you know, take a couple of my cues, you'll do okay. Um, but so we'll talk a little bit about people. Um, so um, one, of the, uh, one of our concepts has always been to hire the absolute best people possible. Um, so whether you start your own business and you've got to hire or you graduate and you go into business and you become a manager and you've got to hire somebody, you want to hire the absolute best person that you can. It seems rational, but sometimes you go into an organization and the hiring criteria is, can this person do the job? Um, and I would submit to you guys that the businesses that focus on hiring the absolute best people for the job outperform companies where they're just looking to find a person to do the, to, to do the job. Uh, I watch a lot of Penn State football on the weekends. We've got a new coach up there. This mantra that he has is clearly showing up on the football field. And this was the uh, first day in his press conference, and in the press conference he said, the plays run better with better players. Um, and in my business, what we've had to do is constantly go out and recruit people that um, are going to help us run better, better plays. Um, and we're constantly, uh, we're constantly recruiting, we're constantly looking for the absolute best players to come to List Track to help us, uh, to help us further, the, further the cause of the, uh, of the business. Um, two things uh, that, that happen there after sort of recruiting is our kind of hiring process. So this slide's got a double meeting. One is you guys are all about to go into, you're going to be interviewing for internships, you're going to be interviewing for full-time uh, positions. So for us, as you look at this thing, there's kind of two, you know, two ways to look at it. One is, one is the lens of you guys getting you know, a job yourself. The other thing is, okay, when I'm a hiring manager, what do I want to do to be able to, to, to conduct the best, uh, the best uh, interview? So the one thing that, that we do at ListTrack is we do a, a pre-interview assessment. So we do two assessments. We do sort of a behavioral assessment, um, kind of psychographical assessment to understand what sort of God-given things does this person um, have, right? So um, we do something called the DISC profile, D-I-S-C. Um, uh, DISC stands for dominance. So dominance is uh, sort, of an, uh, sort of a, a person with a high D would be very outgoing. Um, they would have kind of a dominant uh, personality. Um, that type of person would be the person that wouldn't have a problem, you know, walking up to, to Dr. Williams and saying, I think you were wrong on, on the grade that you gave me, that type of thing. That type of person has a high, high D. Um, DISC, D-I, the I, it stands for influence. So that is somebody that would be outgoing or talkative. Um, that's the person that's always sort of uh, talking in the back. Uh, back of class, or they're talking before class, or out of, they'll talk to anybody. Um, I, we all have those people in our lives, friends and, and family. High, uh, a high I at List Track generally means they'll be a good account manager. They won't have a problem picking up the phone, talking to one of our, one of our customers, engaging with a customer. We'd like that, okay? High D, a high I and a high D generally translates to a good salesperson. That's a person that doesn't have a problem picking up the phone and saying, you know, hey, Bob, I got this great, you know, great opportunity for you. I got a great solution to a problem that I know you have. And, Bob, and then engages Bob in a conversation around sales. That's good. That's the I coming through. At some point in time, that person's got to be able to close the deal. That's where the high D comes, uh, uh, comes in, where the salesperson says, you know, Bob, I need you to sign on the line, which is dotted. That's where the high D comes in. If, if I hire a salesperson with a high I, low D, that person's probably never going to ask for the sale. Um, so that's sort of account manager sales profiles, D and I. So DISC, D-I-S, 
C. So the S stands for steadfastness. Some of us were born, we come out of the womb, so we can change a little bit, but generally these things are sort of God-given types of traits. So out of the womb, some of us are high S. What's S? That's steadfastness. So we found that project managers have a high S, and that's the ability to sort of endure a lot of pain and not complain, um, to be able to kind of uh, take a lot of, of guff from unhappy customers. Sometimes your best customer service reps, your, your, your reps that man the phones for airlines and things like that, you want those guys to have a high S, very high empathy level, level, very empathetic. That's S, so DISC, D-I-S, and then the last one is C, which stands for conscientiousness, and that's attention to detail. Um, so generally we like to have our coders have a high level, our, our developers, to have a high C. That's attention to detail. Nobody likes uh, buggy code, so we like to see developers that have a high C. QA. You never want a QA person with a low, <laughs> with a low attention to detail. It's a, so we're able to do these assessments and get us sort of further down the road with, with, um, with candidates than, than otherwise. Um, and then the other one that we do is we actually give a cognitive test. We do a timed, we do one of the assessments that's got a timed cognitive test. And that one's been very predictive at being able to predict um, how well someone's going to be able to do at list track because of that co timed cognitive test. So we do these pre-interview assessments. If you pass, you get to come in for the interview. Uh, what does the, the, uh, the, the comic here say? Oh, you did dress up for the interview. So. Uh, it's important. Um, I think your visual appearance when you go to an interview is important. You want to dress appropriately. I was dressing myself this morning. I was like, do I wear the same suit I would go when I see the bank, or do I wear jeans here with these guys? I would no normally not wear jeans, but for you guys, I wore jeans. Know your audience. Uh, you know, so know your audience, dress appropriately. We've oftentimes found that people's front seat of their car is an accurate reflection of what their desk is going to look like. So I had a messy dorm room. I hear some chuckles. Some of you guys probably have messy dorm rooms. Um, in hiring, we found that the car is a good reflection of what their desk is going to look like. If their desk is a mess sometimes, their performance at work is a mess. So take that uh, under uh, advisement there. Um, shoes. Forrest Gump, you guys know Forrest Gump? It's sort of a timeless movie. Anybody watch Forrest Gump? You get a little history lesson inside of Forrest Gump. So Gump says you can tell a lot uh, about somebody from their shoes. We like to look at their shoes. The shoes is also sort of a, a, a matchup. One time we hired a guy. This is being recorded, so I have to watch out for this. But we hired a guy once, uh, and he, he was wearing dress shoes, but his shoes were untied. We were like, why is the guy's shoes untied? I don't know. Well, he should probably tie his shoes. This is an important position. Yeah. We hired the guy anyway. Turns out he didn't do very good at list track. So be aware, you know, so when you're in a position of hiring, check out their shoes. Did they take time to tie their shoes? Did they take the time to tie their shoes? Maybe they'll take the time to thank a customer or fill out the, the report in the proper way, that type of thing. So it, all this comes down is the details matter. Details matter when you're in the interview. Details matter when you're interviewing something. And the last thing I'll say is when you're going out to interview, do your research. The worst thing for me when I interview someone, the absolute worst thing when I get an interview is I say, do you have any questions? And the worst thing is they say, no. Like, that's terrible. Like, you might as well just close the book. Thank you. See you later. Do your research. Be inquisitive. Ask questions. Ask anything, anything at all. I don't care what it is. Ask, what are you doing this weekend? It, you know, you got nothing. Just ask something. But having no questions is, you know, you might as well just drop the interview microphone and walk out of the interview because you're probably dead if you don't have any questions. So do, uh, do, some, uh, do your homework there. Understand who you're talking to. So some leadership stuff. Really like this John Maxwell book, All Things Rise and Fall in Leadership. Uh, it's a great book. That maxim is something that, that I carry with me no matter where in, the indus where in my company, we, when we spot problems, there's generally some type of a leadership problem there. Um, uh, sometimes uh, in my line of work, people will say people don't quit a job. 
they quit a boss. Um, you know, so that's some encouragement around, hey, if you go do take a job or you do take an inter internship, sometimes the, the performance of that boss and how well that boss treats you or mentors you um, has a lot to do with sort of the growth of where you are. When you take a full-time job, sometimes you might find a boss that could be a lid to your career. And you might have to make the decision that you've got to go kind of find your magic elsewhere because that boss is blocking you from being successful in other places. And, and it could happen at a company like Listrack, and it surely happens at a lot of other, um, other companies. Another really good book that we've uh, read recently is Extreme Ownership. In that book, they talk about there are no bad teams, only bad leaders. There's some interesting stuff in there. We're running low on time, but that's one that I recommend. Uh, who are these guys? Oh, man, am I dating myself. Who are these guys? Who? Chevy Chase. Yes, Chevy Chase. Who, what's the family? It is the? Griswolds. Yeah, Griswolds, right? Clark, right? Ellen, Rusty, Audrey. Anybody remember the dog's name? Dinky. The dog's name was Dinky, okay? Who's seen the movie? American Vacation, anybody? Seen? Okay, we got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, video guy back there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what happens here in this, uh, in this one, in this, what happens here? Video guy, do you remember? Oh, this guy's got it. What happens? Correct. Clark accidentally ties the dog to the bumper of the car. The cop pulls him over and it's like, you drug Dinky 100 miles an hour or 100 miles through the desert. So you guys are supposed to laugh a little bit more. Man, holy mackerel. When does drinking start on campus? Not till... Yeah, they, they got three more years. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway. <laughs> I should have ca caught you guys. I mean, you talking about for me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm good about another hour. We should. I should have come. I should have come by on another hour. That's good. That's good. I should have come by tonight around 11. Uh, so, HR at List Track. One of the things we did. It's, you know, it's not written on the on the walls. We've got kind of this no dinky the dog policy, right? So we're not going to drag somebody a hundred miles through the desert if it's not working. If it's not working with their boss, if they're not really enthusiastic about the work they're doing, they're not going to drag you through the desert to do that. So that's one of the changes that I made as a leader in thinking, okay, we're going to hire you, you're part of the family, and you know, you're either never going to leave or I don't ever want to um, you know, sever ties. So um, being passionate about the work that you do and having it uh, be a good fit is really important for us in the way that we think about um, the way we think about business. Uh, one of the things that we do at List Track is we have a profit sharing program. We believe in giving back. It was an important part as you guys go off and become business leaders. I think giving back and sharing in the profits um, is something that's really important for all companies to be uh, to be doing. Uh, one of the things that was really important at List Track is developing a culture of sales. Um, for you guys that, that might meet that DISC profile of the high D, high I, you like to interact with people, you don't mind asking people some hard questions, you might have a, uh, a career in sales. There are few uh, high school guidance counselors that sit you sort of disruptive, uh, you know, most talkatives down and say, congratulations you will probably have an extremely high paying job in sales in your future. They don't say that. They say like, you're being disruptive, shut up, be quiet, that sort of thing. A lot of companies need folks to go into sales. Sales is not um, a dirty word. Um, if you happen to be good at sales, I encourage you guys to look at careers in sales because um, in many companies, the highest performing salesperson makes more than the person that owns the business or runs the business in many cases. Um, they very, very rarely will tell you that in, uh, in uh, your guidance counseling types of things. Two really good books, if, if, this is, if you're passionate about uh, sales. Uh, on the left is this thing called Challenger Sales. Uh, you read Challenger Sales, you go interview the, with the uh, head of sales for a sales internship. You'll be better off by doing that. And then a, one that, a book that was really important uh, for me and my uh, development in sales is a book called uh, Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. So that was, uh, that was one. 
Uh, and then just kind of uh, as I wrap up uh, here, another book that was really um, great encouragement for me as I was transforming my business, and if you remember that hockey stick, as I was in that inflection of kind of flat growth to growing, um, I read this book called G uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. He's an old school guy, um, but he's got some really great wisdom inside of the books that he writes. And one of the concepts that he writes about is this concept of a, of a hedgehog concept. So it's this idea of three cons concentric circles for any business, okay? So for any business, you wanna think about, hey, what is, this, what is this business deeply passionate about? What problems are you trying to solve? Um, you know, what industries are you in? What are you, what are you, really, what are you really passionate about? Um, what drives your economic engine? Essentially, what will customers pay for? So what are you doing that provides value that customers will pay for? So those two together are, are pretty powerful. And then the next one is, where can you be the best in the world? And if you happen to be a regional player, where can you be the best in, in the region? And generally this means sort of narrowing down your focus and not being sort of great at everything, but being great at one sort of specific thing what specifically drives your economic engine, and specifically where in a geographic area can you be best at. And that's generally where there's a, where there's a win. Um, from, a, from a personal perspective, and, and this is my last slide for you guys, and I'll open up if anybody's got some questions, but personally for you guys, you know, you know, what do you love? As you guys think about where should I take my internship? Where should I take my career? You know, where do I want to, where do I want to live? What, what do I want to do? So maybe this slide can, can help. So, you know, what do you love to do? What, what pays well? So this is the economic engine, sort of what, what, what pays well? And, and, you know, what are you good at? What, what gifts has God given you when you came out of the womb? You know, what are you good at? For me, it was not math and science. Thought I was going to go to college, be a doctor. Very quickly got weeded out of those types of weed out classes. They didn't even go close to that area of campus anymore. Um, so math and science, not what I was good at. I liked computers. I liked to talk. Um, and turns out the internet and technology seemed to pay well. So that was the win. Uh, that was the win for me. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. Thanks for having me. Dr. Williams, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take your company to like grow into what it is now, like the time period? So yeah, I was I was uh, talking to my son last night. He's uh, eight. I uh, said, so Carson, what do you want to make? Uh, you know, when when you first year out of college, I asked him, how much you want to make first year out of college? He said, I want to make as much as you make, more than you, Dad. I'm like, what? He's like, no, 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 no. What first year you were out of college? I'm like, oh, seven thousand dollars. Okay, cool. Yes, yes, that's that's a, that's attainable. So we, so first year I probably made seven grand take home, my W-2, second year I probably made $9,000, then probably third year $12,000. Uh, it sucks, starting a business really blows um, a lot. Um, all your friends will make fun of you, you know, your, your people from home will say like, why is he doing that? Because, you know, Freddie went and took a job with Accenture and, you know, Fred's doing really great and why is Bobby? you know, still living in the, in the basement, you know, with the cereal bowls stacked up. Um, so you got to believe in what you do. So it, but it took a while. It took, it takes a while. There's, you'll have a lot of employees that like won't work out because who takes a job with a guy in his parents' basement with the cereal bowls stacked up, right? You know, sort of, uh, you know, with my buddies from college were crazy enough to do that, but you'll also get some other crazies that come along with you and then trying to figure out, you know, how to go through that. So it took a while. We pro it probably took us, um, probably took us four or five years, four years to make our first million dollars, probably. So that's $83,000 a month is all you need to make to get to a million bucks plus some change. Um, so. You get going there, you make a million bucks, you feel pretty good about yourself, and you're able to buy a new pair of jeans. Otherwise, you're wearing the same jeans from high school. 
Yeah. Uh, Penn State. Uh, I didn't want to go there. I went, wanted to go other places. Uh, but uh, Dad's like, if I'm paying, you're going to Penn State. So that was the one that I had no choice in that matter. I had a good time. I uh, drank a lot of beer, chased a lot of girls. Uh, and, and it gave me an opportunity to launch my business. Um, and I studied uh, HP, health policy and administration because uh, my dad said I couldn't be a business major. I said, there's too many business majors. I think you can major in anything. Um, honestly, uh, I think it's about what you do during the time. Internships are really, really critical. I had two internships at Hershey Medical Center, worked in the IT, team, IT department there, uh, ended up like, you know, sort of starting the business with my internship coordinator type of stuff. So it's, it's really what you do. It's really about resources. It's really about the resources that you use. Uh, I'll tell you one um, that uh, um, I took a picture of. Uh, Karl Lagerfeld, anybody know that guy? He's the sort of creative genius behind the Chanel brand. Okay, so the Chanel, aspirational. Karl Lagerfeld is this old school uh, German guy that speaks, looks very old school and speaks very old school German. But he brought up a slide around curiosity. Um, that's probably the X factor um, in what makes a great uh, team member and somebody that just kind of bounces around is somebody that is, um, is not content with the way that the world is today, the way that the world presents, and is always asking why. Why is this? Why is that? Why is this happening? Uh, why, does this, why does this partner you know, behave in this way? Why does the software work this way? Um, something that like doesn't take no for an answer, like, that, like, you know, okay, no, that's the first step here, that type of thing, and is always kind of challenging the process. So curiosity is probably the one thing. We haven't figured out a test for curiosity, um, but the ability to be curious and to try to understand the world that they live in and try to shape that is probably the, the one biggest thing that's out of my reach. Yeah? Um, when it comes to like your new college, your new college experience and starting your business, like you look back on it now, is there, would there be anything that you would do differently? I would, uh, it's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, you know, you don't, you don't, no one has uh, a looking glass. Like you can't really, you know, you, like my things like lessons from the future, but you can't really, you know what you know. Um, I would go back to kind of like the people that you're, that you're around um, and uh, the people that you, you surround yourself with. And, you know, there are some, there are some limiting factors like time and, and money. But on a college campus, there are a lot of resources on a college campus. Um, so, and my encouragement, and if I probably would have done anything differently, it would have been to go out and probably seek more resources on campus. Go to, into the, the, the MBA school, try to talk my way into more MBA classes. or go to the engineering, the computer engineering school and try to, try to network with more uh, computer engineers um, to get closer to those guys. And, and so these, these campuses are, are filled with, with resources. And um, I think resourcefulness is the one thing that we have as humans that can really be an X factor beyond time and money, is how we use the resources that are at our fingertips. And you'll, there'll be few places in this world where you will go that you'll have more resources at your fingertips and the ability to sort of cruise around and go places than you do right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, big, big initiative. Um, big, big initiative um, around 
uh, optimizing spend. Um, so um, you know we're not we're not creating a whole lot more consumers in the United States, right? So there's 300 and some Americans. Um, so our brand, John Barbados, where we can help John Barbados and the John Barbados brand is say, okay, here are our customers. We're going to apply artificial intelligence to your customer base to understand really what motivates them, what are the reasons why they buy from you, where did they come from, model those, that, those attributes, and then go out and find new customers that look like their existing customers in an efficient way. So there's lots of those types of, those types of things. Um, yeah, you betcha. Personalization, things around personalization is a big, big area of, of artificial intelligence as well.